Thank you for joining me on my soapbox today. My name is Mindy Preffling, and I am the Client Services Senior Manager for Spencer Ogden, a global energy and infrastructure recruitment agency. As global recruitment experts in energy and infrastructure, we're building an industry that impacts millions. We provide leading recruitment services to our clients and candidates, creating careers to power a sustainable future. The Soapbox series is a podcast that we've launched to have open discussions with thought leaders in the renewable energy industry and to discuss the human element behind our industry and the challenges we face in recruiting, retaining, and promoting top talent, especially as it pertains to diversity, equity, and inclusion. My guest today is Casey Peters. Casey is the Director of Industry Relationships for a commercial industrial solar company in Colorado. She is a known innovator, communicator, and mentor for the distributed solar and storage industry. Casey has pioneered new markets and sales strategies for organizations, including Sun Edison, Alta Energy, and held board positions on COSA and ICEA. Currently, she develops marketing strategies for project M&A, co-development, and her company's proprietary community solar servicing tool. In her work, she engages community solar portfolio owners, project developers, and municipal entities for long-term partnerships to solve complex energy challenges. She has been recognized for her work by the Denver Business Journal and the Environmental Entrepreneurs. She's a known thought leader in the renewable energy industry who has been featured in Solar Power World, Energy News Network, and in white papers for SIA and Clean Energy for Biden. On today's episode, Casey shares her tragic story of how she's been fighting for her life since 2019 when she was diagnosed with colon cancer. For some context, Casey and I are about the same age and she has a young family. She and her husband have a five-year-old son together and live in the Denver metro area. There are many incredible things about Casey, her will to survive, yes, but her undeterred passion and purpose to make the planet more sustainable and a better place for her son and our next generation. I'm so grateful for Casey sharing her story because she helps to create a space for other people to do the same in the workplace. We are not robots, we are humans, and we have human challenges like disease, emotions, families, and purpose, and our workplace should be a safe place to accommodate that. Well, Casey, thank you so much for joining me on my soapbox today. I'm really excited to have you. I'd love for you to start us off with an introduction to you. Who are you? Oh, that is a loaded question. Um, my name is Casey Peters. I am the director of industry relationships at Pivot. And that's a fun title that I got to make up um, because basically what I do is speak for Pivot um, with our industry partners. And so it's a, a new it's a new position for Pivot to be able to own projects, to be able to develop more deep partnerships. We've always been a very partnership-driven company, but um, as we'll talk about today, uh, in the past 12 years, I've made a lot of friendships and been able to observe a lot of really great industry trends. And now I get to cash in on all that and I get to uh, figure out how Pivot can be involved with really interesting new projects and promising new partners. So that's what I get to do. I'm also the mom of a super great five-year-old boy um, and the wife of a uh, civil engineer who oftentimes takes a lot of the things that I have as big ideas and helps me put them into uh, more practical solutions. Um, So that's me. Thank you. Thanks for the the high level overview. Um, I can't believe your son is five years old because I think when I met you, you were pregnant with your son. (laughs) I have quite the story about that. There's a a fun LinkedIn story that I wrote um, about should pregnant women ride the solar coaster? Um, Not sure if you want to get into that story yet, but (laughs) that was, that was a moment that the the solar industry almost lost me, but I'm so glad that I stayed. Well, you're definitely, I, I feel like your story is one of perseverance. So I want to talk, I want to get into the details of that a little bit more. So let's actually take it back to the beginning of your solar career, because I think that was uh, a few years before you had your son. So yep. take us back to the beginning. How did you get into the industry? So it was 2010 and I was living in Southeast Pennsylvania, Philly area, um, and 
I was working in politics, um, but there was some turmoil within the, the political sphere where I was and I needed a new job. Uh, luckily, and this is, a, this is something that probably isn't replicated too much these days, um, although there are plenty of dating apps out there, I had met a guy on a dating app um, who still works in the industry. So I haven't talked to him in years, but if you're listening, Brian, hello, thank you. Uh, I met him and he was a engineer for a residential solar company that was growing out of Delaware. Uh, and it was about an hour commute. And I said, the thing I liked most about my job in politics was advertising, marketing, and convincing people to do something. And he said, you know what? Maybe you should work with us. And so I worked for a company called Centricity Power. And this is before the days of even PPA financing on the East Coast. Uh, this is the days of $8 a lot uh, installations, dollar a lot commissions. Um, I worked to organize all of our brochures to explain what the heck solar was, uh, worked every single home show and dog show in the area, uh, and really got to know a lot about um, the industry, but, but primarily how solar worked. Um, back in the day, we were selling Enphase and Solar World, and I think Back then we were like 1% of Enphase's entire market share to show you either how big we were or how small Enphase was back then. Um, and it was, it was a really fun way to get to know uh, really the technology and what made people buy. Uh, so that was my first job in solar. And then there was some turmoil at that company. Um, it, you know, very much like a solar coaster that I'll talk about a lot. Um, we had a big footprint in um, Delaware, but also in Southeast Pennsylvania and in New Jersey. And to show how long ago this was, when New Jersey stopped a rebate that they had, we thought there's no more business in New Jersey to be had. New Jersey is no longer a solar state. <laughs> Um, I'm originally from New Jersey and my mom has kicked me every time saying, why don't you come back to Jersey? And I'm like, the market's almost over, right? It's almost, <laughs> no. Um, but I do remember the day that the Pennsylvania rebate went away and it was um, right around the time that the uh, SREC market closed in Pennsylvania. So we went from having this lucrative rebate for solar um, and these like $250 recs to then um, DC closing their borders, saying that they weren't going to accept uh, PJM Rex anymore. Um, so we had very little market. Uh, and that was sort of the beginning of the end of that company. I also think, um, not to tell tales in school, but the a lot of the companies that started right around 2008 through 2011 um, through ERA funding were a lot of the old mortgage brokers. Um, and so that that attracted a lot of colorful people to the industry. Um, and uh, I think as a result of that, there was just some um, just some things that could have happened internally in the company that that ultimately led to us going from, you know, 100 installs a year, which was a lot back then, to, you know, being behind on bills and such. And so that company happened to close doors in around 2012. Um, but... Um, by the time it closed, Brian and my relationship was no more, um, but I'd actually met a different guy. So I, I tell my story as my solar, my story with solar is a love story, both literally and figuratively. Um, I met the man who is now my husband, um, when I was visiting Chicago randomly and I had met him in New Year's Eve of going into 2012. And he was like, you should move to Illinois. And I was like, why would I move to Illinois? My job is doing great in Delaware. And when it was clear that it was no longer doing well, I said, yeah, you know what? I should move to Chicago. Is there a solar program in Chicago? And without even really looking into it, I'd heard there was some kind of a rebate and I was like, yeah, sure. I can make this work in Illinois. I had no idea that, um, that program was really challenging back then. Um, so I had worked for another residential, small commercial company that was just trying to rebrand, trying to get, um, their feet together from a very niche market, um, that everyone was just having issues with. Um, so 
at that time, I also signed up to help with the Illinois Solar Energy Association. And eventually I was elected to their board of directors. So I got really into policy. And so I said, great, I'm managing what was supposed to be a marketing department is now I'm managing marketing and sales. And now I'm doing all of the sales because these are small companies. Um, so now I'm all of a sudden trying to sell these products, make new products, get the word out about stuff and kind of explain solar in Illinois wholeheartedly. Uh, I need to make sure this program works. So, um, super shout out to Leslie, uh, Lisa, Shannon, the women who were leading the charge in solar in Illinois back in, uh, around 2013, when we had tried so hard to get that future jobs act passed, um, and the story of solar in Illinois, this could be an entirely additional podcast. Feel free to, to have a whole thing on the heartbreak and heart love that is Illinois. Um, we were trying to make that policy work, uh, but for years we're sort of blocked on it. So that company I was working for originally in Illinois um, also closed its doors. Again, solar is driven by state policy, those ups and downs that we have no control over, and then entrepreneurs who can either make it work or not. And I think both of those coming together um, creates a a, a challenge on two fronts. And that's sort of what happened with those first two companies. Um, So then I I met this wonderful company who was formerly known as Microgrid. At the time, they were Microgrid Energy. They were based out of St. Louis. And I was like, yeah, you know what? It's time for me to make another move. This other company has uh, gone the wayward side. I'll, I was looking to make a change. I was interviewing with several different solar companies. Um, but the thing that really brought me to microgrid was this guy named Rick Hunter, who's our founder and now our strategic advisor, um, or chief strategy officer. Um, I was looking at three different solar companies and I was like, "Ah, this one is a really great residential company. And I think they've got promise. These guys are a construction firm and I can just build out their whole solar thing. What can you do? And he said, why don't we just partner with all of them and we can make sure that everyone succeeds. I was like, yes, yes, that's it. I never want to say no to people. I never want to not partner with somebody. I want this industry to grow. Yes. And it was a great fit. Um, from there, um, we did some cool projects. We did uh, the largest, uh, although Microgrid was a primarily uh, commercial company, we did have a residential arm um, out of St. Louis. I was the only person working in Chicago. And then I started um, what was the largest residential solarized program in the Midwest at the time. That's a whole nother podcast story. Uh, but then I also worked on quite a few um, projects in Illinois, but The problem in Illinois was that we knew that this policy would pass. We had super majorities in House and Senate, um, or at least strong majorities in those two places. We just couldn't get the bill to come to the floor. And I worked with ICEA to organize solar lobby days. We were down in the Capitol. We had um, neighborhood meetings. We did everything that we could, but for complicated policy reasons, it just was not being actually debated on the floor. And you can read plenty of articles about Exelon and Madigan on that. Um, And so in 2015, I called Rick again, he was located in St. Louis and I was like, Rick, I feel like the solar coaster is happening to me again. Once again, this time I have a, a great leader that's keeping the company together love you guys. But the other part that we need for a company to survive is good policy. And we just not seeing it in Illinois. I had looked at frequency regulation through batteries. I had looked at selling RECs optionally. I had done everything that I could, um, but could not make a project pencil for a PPA. And I was like, I just need to move. I was like, I'm, I I can either leave the industry or I can leave Illinois. And he's like, please don't leave the industry where do you want to move? And I was like, Denver. He's like, can I tell you a secret? I would love to move to Boulder. And I was like, what? We have this big company in in St. Louis. Um, And so I 
said, I am moving to Denver. I um, recruited a, a guy who'd been working on projects with me in Illinois, who happened to also be moving in, into Denver. And we set up shop and we were microgrid and we were just going to go for it. We were waiting for Rick to move out. We were waiting for the company to, to kind of realize that the talent in Denver was just so strong because historically speaking, Colorado was a great market. Um, so I was working on that for about five months before I got a knock on the door. Um, and it was Sun Edison and everyone knew in early 2016 that Sun Edison did not have much of a future. They just, they were the, the turp was going and the value of the stock had dropped. And I knew that if I went to Sun Edison, my future wouldn't be probably with Sun Edison. It, it was like a, it's either going to go really, really well or awful. And at the time I had a dog and a husband and I wanted to, to see. And to my company's credit, honestly, to Rick Hunter's credit, he saw that there is an opportunity for me to go work with this big established company that was already in the position to buy some of microgrids projects. If I could be the other person on the side of that partnership, it was a good opportunity for me and for microgrid pivot at the time. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. And I think that to have a good mentor in the industry, it's hard when that person is the person who's also employing you because you don't want to lose talent. Um, but he saw in that moment that it was going to be a make or break thing and gave me permission to fly. And I told him this is a middle school breakup. Um, it's not an, if it's a, when I come back, uh, and then I went off to Sun Edison and then within six weeks of me getting hired there, uh, company filed for bankruptcy, <laughs> which we knew was going to happen. Um, what I didn't know was going to happen was I was going to get pregnant. So got pregnant, immediately found out the company was going to bankruptcy. I think the person that I told first was obviously my husband, right? Like, Hey, we're having a baby. And I told my mom, Hey, we're having a baby. Um, the very next person was my boss at Sun Edison, this guy, Aaron, who's great. Um, and as all the rest of us were sort of sitting in this limbo saying, what is our next job? I was just like in the corner crying and be like, what do you mean next job? <laughs> I, I can't get a job. And he really helped me network. Um, I was on a plane to intersolar right after it was until July that my department got cut, but I was on a plane to intersolar. He helped me line up, um, interviews. I landed with a company called Alta energy that was doing, um, consulting for corporates and, that was a, a great company to be at. Um, the model was, I think, ahead of its time. We wanted to consult with corporates that had ESG goals. But I think in 2016, 2017, the idea of ESG was either for incredibly established companies that already had their own energy teams or was sort of unheard of by a lot of companies that didn't really understand solar. So, um, ultimately that company was also a, a failed startup. I say that my love affair with solar started, um, with meeting someone on a dating app and not being so sure about solar and really blossomed into loving so much about this industry. And even the heartbreak that I've had, uh, about switching companies and, um, and, you know, commissions that may or may not have been paid from companies that may or may not exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, I still take that as experience and I'm so happy to have helped pave the way for so many people, um, that are in the industry today and that will be in the industry tomorrow. Thank you for that background. Um, a long story. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I didn't know you were in politics before and I'm, you know, I was kind of writing down, uh, your different job titles over the course of the last 15 years or so. And I have politics, marketing and sales, and it's all, it's all kind of the same job, just packaged a little bit differently, isn't it? That's what I like to tell people. Um, 
I was looking back, I was doing a, uh, a career review recently, um, just as part of my annual review. And I was like, yeah, I've had a lot of different job titles, but for the most part, I've just been making new products, meeting new people and creating new partnerships. Yes. And that's, that's just so exciting that you get to be in an industry that you can do all those things because in so many of the established industries, the products have already been designed. The relationships are, you know, dozens, if not, you know, generations old, and there's such a high barrier to be able to change things. But here in solar, we haven't had that. And so I've been able to pioneer all those pieces for different companies. So Obviously, when you got into the industry in 2010, things looked a little bit different. And like you just described, I mean, you know, I kind of jotted down different words like uh, resistance, opposition, blocked, mm-hmm. uh, either you make it happen or you don't. Like it was kind of feast or famine or maybe more famine um, while you were getting like snacks started. And famine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Snacks and famine. Um but obviously you're a glutton for pain. So you just kept going for it because you you saw the potential or you were fighting the good fight. Um, how have you seen the industry evolve and maybe where are we today as an industry? Yeah, I think, I think there's still a good amount of people who are two guys and a truck. Like, and I think we're always going to see that. And that's great. Um, because we're still going to have these very small businesses that um, are just really innovative and nimble, whether that be servicing residential or that's developing projects. It's always astounding to me when I find out that like three people put together like a $20 million utility scale project. And I'm like, what, where did that come from? Um, But I do think that unlike in the beginning where we were so focused on incentives and the incentives and the market education had so much to do with if your company could survive or not. Now solar has become cost competitive in so many different places. Um, And it's also becoming more accessible. So we're seeing more finance driven. When I started, you had to take out a home equity line of credit because you were putting a $40,000 solar array on your house and how else were you going to pay for it? And now I go to Costco and the fun people at Sunrun come up to me and say, would you like no money down solar? And I'm like, that's, that's just amazing that you could do that. And then on top of that, we're now seeing community solar in which not only is it no cost to participate, but you can leave it at any time. So you're not even like installing equipment on your house, which is to me, it's just this great equalizer. So I think the products themselves have evolved and that's really great. And then also seeing the financing of companies themselves come into the space. So it's no longer, you know, the example I gave in the original um, description was that we had a couple guys from the mortgage industry who put together this, this thing And now we're getting these large institutional investors backing people. Now we're getting large private equity. We're getting so much more diligence on on the companies themselves. I used to tell people um, when they uh, interviewed at a company to ask for the financials of that company and not to accept the job unless you were absolutely sure that they could pay your paycheck. I don't have to do that anymore. Like that I would say is just... Is, is really reassuring and I think it's going to make a better, a better environment to accept more employees as well as servicing more um, participants within uh, renewable energy. So it, it, well, it's like the industry is too big to ignore anymore. Yes. Like I think there was some time where maybe investors were like, oh, we'll see where this solar thing goes. We'll see where this renewable energy trend goes. But for now, it's not, it's not worth our attention. Um, and then, you know, the last few years in particular, it's just blown up. And so many companies like you talked about, I mean, the M&A going on in the industry is almost obscene. Like there's just a, every day a new company is being bought um, or acquired by, you know, some like major oil and gas companies or by other larger renewable energy companies. So I wonder if we're going to be in like a Ford GM, um, you know, 
battle in the near future. I wonder how much consolidation is ultimately going to happen in this. I think this next five years is going to be really interesting because I think there's been a lot of money poured into the industry. I think there's going to be, you know, inevitably some of those companies won't exist five years from now. Um, just because, you know, there's consolidation, maybe they get bought by someone else. Maybe they aren't as competitive as another group. Um, there will be a lot of consolidation. Do I think there's going to be like three solar companies in the future? Probably not. Um, because the solar companies that are really innovating right now have all created niches that are slightly different. So like pivot focus on community solar, um, and CNI solar is, is CNI has been a market that's just been really hard to navigate generally. It's one of the, the only sectors of the market that just has not grown um, respective to, to the rest of the industry. And to be good at that is really, is really interesting. And then the fact that we're looking at things on a more national landscape, um, you know, some companies will focus on just projects in the Northeast um, or just projects in New York, for instance, the fact that we will be looking at diversifying our portfolio through, you know, the established markets like New York and, and Massachusetts and Minnesota, but also looking at this new markets like Hawaii and New Mexico, that is something that our company can say does proudly um, that either some other companies don't want to do or, or can't do. And so we're still going to see a lot of different flavors of renewables in the future. I do think you're going to have some pretty big companies um, and then others that can still be, be nimble. Um, and I will say that I, I, the thing that I worry about in the solar industry is that we get so commoditized that it's like a kilowatt hour is a kilowatt hour. Like where does that hour come from? Very much like the utilities right now are just like, you're so divorced from where your energy comes from and the return on building infrastructure is established. You know, we've already figured this out. This is the way of doing things. Distributed energy in particular has really disrupted that model. And I'm so proud to be part of that disruption. And I hope that we continue to come up with new finance models. Uh, community solar was not even a thing more than a decade ago. And now it's it's the fastest growing segment in the industry. Um, PPAs, you know, 2010 on the East Coast, we just, I, I remember seeing um, Sungevity's truck for the first time, being like, who are they? What is this? Um, so I'm really hopeful that companies can still remain nimble, um, that we can get the cost of capital down. So we've got some people who just rinse and repeat, get things super cheap. And then other people who are coming up with new models to be able to, to redefine where we think we get our energy and make a closer connection between the electrons produced and the people who turn on their light bulb. Yeah. It seems like there's still a lot of space for innovation and improvement in the industry. And, and a lot of companies are still putting a lot of energy into that. Oh yeah. And, and battery storage. I yeah. mean, the biggest joke that I have about battery storage is that every year that I've been in the industry, battery storage is just five years, just five years out, Give five years. And, we'll be fine. <laughs> and it's like, cool. 2010 batteries is going to be great by 2015. And and then even at Sun Ed, we were like, yeah, no, we're going to put batteries in all of our projects. And that was 2016. It's like, okay. But we're finally seeing it now. And we're seeing different applications for it. Um, and battery storage, you know, you go to a solar conference and there's like a hundred different modules that are all generally the same technology. But you go to a battery storage conference and there's like a hundred different types of the batteries themselves. And like, where are we getting that energy? What is it used for? How are we deploying it? What are the systems that run it? Like that is just so exciting to be able to see. Um, and I'm really hopeful that we're going to start to see that really scale in markets other than California and Massachusetts. Um, so that's exciting. And then this a uh, study that the CCSA just put out um, along with a coalition called Local Solar for All um, about the value of distributed generation as not only a tool for resilience, but also the lowest cost of energy. Like that's using the same technology we've had. We're just finally modeling it right. And so we don't even have to like improve the technology itself. We just have to like 
tell regulators that if you're not building transmission, you're saving money. What? Um, and so there's innovations that can happen that don't, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time to, to come up with something that can really change the game. Um, which again, you're seeing the, the change the game stuff on battery storage and deployment of that. But now we're also seeing these like slight tweaks that I think are going to get us to real penetration on the grid. So I want to take it back to the evolution of the industry, because this is something I know that's um, near and dear to you and something that, especially as it pertains to the DE&I topic, um, something that you've, I think, personally experienced an evolution um, being a pioneering woman in the industry. So, and I, I also want to kind of take it back a moment because I, I think you and I met, I have this like vivid memory of talking to you before or right when you were laid off from or, or when Sun Edison went belly up, um, I guess, I don't know if you call that a layoff. Um, yeah. It, it was a reduction in force. Okay. HR. Yes. There you go. <laughs> and I, I think we spoke then. And I remember you were, you also had just found out that you were pregnant yeah. and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like you were really scared about yeah. what your next move was. So I'd love to kind of talk a little bit more about that part of your journey and just how the industry has evolved from a diversity lens. Yeah, I was really terrified. I, I'm obviously, I'm telling strangers that I'm pregnant before, like I even have ultrasounds. Like that's not something you normally do. Um, but I knew that I needed to like actually make a change. And the problem was, in order to get FMLA, you have to be with a company for a full year and you have to work for a company that has more than 50 people. And FMLA is not paid maternity leave. FMLA is just that they can't fire you. So in theory, if I was looking at a job and they hired me and then I said, hey, in four months, I have to take maternity leave, like, they can't fire you because you're pregnant. But if I said, I need six weeks, they could say, cool, you get your two weeks and then give us your two weeks notice. Like there's nothing that stopped them from ultimately not giving me that ability to, um, to come back. And that was just so eye opening. I remember being really concerned that, you know, my entire department and honestly, most of the CNI um, department within Sun Ed was um, reorganized around the same time. So some people went to um, a new company that was started. Others of us um, were just kind of looking for new work. Um, and in that moment, I realized that my male colleagues could negotiate their next job based on salary. So they could get a job offer and say, I need 10% more. I was coming into a job saying, thank you so much for giving me a job. Um, could I please have some time off to like have a baby? And like, that didn't feel fair. And it was frustrating to think that potentially I stunted my career by not asking for that increase in salary at that time, because salary compounds. So the salary that you set out at one job, you get a cost of living raise on that or a potential raise if you're doing really great. And then the next job asks you, well, how much were you making at your last job? And so if you're negotiating on things that aren't salary, then that salary is not affecting you just that year. It's affecting you for a really long time after that. Um, and the company that I ultimately went to at the time just didn't even have a maternity policy because it, it was just you know, a very small group of people um, trying to make a startup work. And I now looking back sort of foolishly said, yeah, I just need six weeks. Like after they gave me the, the job, after they gave me the, the offer letter, I was like, and by the way, I won't be able to travel around Christmas. And I really regret one thing. It wasn't just that I asked for time off without pay um, because I was just so grateful to have a job, but I also decided that I was okay with traveling really quickly. So I started traveling in eight weeks. And that wasn't something that the company really outright said, you have to travel at eight weeks. But I remember hearing, when are you okay with traveling? And 
I was just so nervous to not have a job. Um, because coincidentally our lease was up on our apartment and you can't buy a house unless you have a job. So you can't, we we couldn't get a a house just based on my husband's income. It had to be both of our income. And so I had a hundred days to find a job, buy a house, have a baby. And so I was not really in a position to, to be super choosy. Again, the company I worked for was great. I'm not faulting them at any point. It's mostly just the thought of the industry at the time of like, okay, let's sign you up. Um, one of the things that I did at the time, um, like shortly thereafter, um, was I work really closely with women in renewable industry, sustainable energy to tell my story. Um, and I also, before that, um, tried to do my own little nonprofit startup with some friends, um, called women in solar energy. And one of the things that I had talked about so openly was can companies who have good maternity policies publicize that on their webpage? Could I search through companies that I know that if I'm either planning to have a family or that I already know I'm going to have a family or that I already have a family, um, can I know that you are not just open to having me and not just legally required to have me, but you're excited to have me so that I know that when I go in for an interview, the pregnancy thing, don't worry, I don't have to negotiate leave. I'm going to negotiate salary and that's going to help me in, in the current position. It's going to help me grow in that position, or it's going to help me find another job later. And I think we're finally seeing a lot of companies do that. I'm so excited that so many companies have stepped at the bar. The support that I saw at the, um, rise conference this year was just outstanding. And our company has put in a great, uh, maternity policy. We're always pushing to make it even better. Um, but I think that that's, that's a decision that I, I just, I'm hoping that other women don't have to go through of I'm in a pinch. I have to find a job. I either have to leave the industry or I have to, um, I have to work somewhere that I'm feeling pressured to travel. And I traveled when my son was eight weeks old and I just remember being just so upset and like bringing all my pumping supplies on the the plane and having to like leave meetings to do that. And I, um, he's a great kid now and is totally comfortable with me traveling. And I travel all the time when it's not COVID, um, but that's hard. And then, um, one thing that you and I haven't discussed, um, is my most recent personal challenges, um, that I've been very open with on LinkedIn. So if you've been following me on LinkedIn, you haven't, please follow me because I love followers. (laughs) Um, but I, in 2020, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. And then in 2021, this past summer, the colon cancer wasn't just stage three, which was curable. It's now stage four. Um, and so I've gone through a number of surgeries. I've gone through chemotherapy. Um, one of the things that again, made me so in love with the company that I'm with was when I first went for this emergency surgery, um, I ended up in the hospital for three weeks and I loved my job and being in the hospital is scary, but it's also really boring. (laughs) And I remember being like, I'm going to get back to work as soon as I can. And like calling the company and being like, Hey guys, don't worry. I can still negotiate things from this hospital bed. It's going to be great. And I was just getting ready to go back to work, um, right. It was like getting out of the hospital and the now CEO of our company, this guy, Tom Hunt came to my hospital bed. And first of all, outside of all that, everyone in my company volunteered to like make us meals. And so many people visited. And I was like, this is like a family. Um, oh. but Tom came to my, my bedside and said, Casey, we want you to take a break. And we know that your body needs to take this break. And we want you to know that we're going to support you through this break. Um, I had coincidentally signed up for short-term disability, which at the time was a um, optional opt-in buy-in from our company. Um, Since then, the company has made that a short-term and long-term disability as a function of everyone's job so that you never have to worry about, should I go back to work 
or should I, um, should I think about my health? And, um, one thing that I haven't said publicly at all, cause this is what happened this past week, um, which is partially why I moved our filming, um, is that my husband just got diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Yeah. And <laughs> the odds of that happening are infinitesimally small. Um, and we're okay telling the story. Um, I've talked with him about it. Um, but it was a shock to all of us. And so right now I'm working with the company and even if, you know, short-term disability is supposed to be for your own health. Um, but this pivot has been again, making meal train for me again, everyone in the company keeps offering to, to watch our son. Um, but, uh, the support that I've gotten and the reassurances that I've gotten that this is not going to impact my, um, long-term career goals, if I still choose to have those. Um, and that pivot is going to stand behind me is just, I think a testament to the company. Um, but I also, the reason I'm so public with this story is not just because I think people should work for pivot, but I think people should work for pivot. <laughs> um, it's also because, you know, for so long I have fought for women's rights in the industry. And I don't think we're there hundred percent, but I think we've come a very long way. And, you know, as testament of all of these companies having these really aggressive, uh, just DNI roles in general, when it comes to racial, when it comes to disadvantaged communities, when it comes to um, women. Um, but I think the next stage is potentially disabilities and those who have long-term chronic illness. Um, and I think that's been a taboo in the workplace. Um, you know, for years, you didn't say pregnancy on TV and you didn't say pregnancy at work because you're afraid you're going to get fired and you weren't a protected class of people until, um, until recent years. And now that same stigma is around people who have long-term chronic illness. Um, and I want people to know that by talking about your illness, um, you can ask for accommodations. So like when I was pregnant, I should have asked for more accommodations. I should have said, no, I'm not okay traveling eight weeks. I need 12 weeks off. Um, I should have said all those things. And now that I'm public with my disability, I tell my boss, Hey, I've got a chemo cycle that peaks every three weeks. That last few days of that three weeks, I might be very tired. And if I don't respond to emails, um, are you okay with that? And they said, yes, because we know that you're working like hell for the other you know, two and a half weeks. Um, and they see that value there. And the fact that I'm honest about it means that I'm not falling off the face of the earth and that they can trust me as an employee. So that helps them communicate with me. It also helps that if I'm public about my illness and my company is public about their accommodations, it means that other people who need accommodations can also feel like they are heard and it feels less scary for them because what I don't ever want to happen is I don't want someone to be as scared as I was when I was pregnant and to think that your entire career rests on someone finding out that you're not having a beer during an interview, um, which totally happened to me. Wow. Um, and I want people to know that these companies are embracing humans as humans and not as cogs in a machine. Um, so that's been my latest crusade. Uh, I wrote a fun LinkedIn piece called everyone dies. I'm just doing it on LinkedIn. Um, if you want a fun read, it's less depressing than it sounds, but, um, I'm just so grateful that I'm so grateful in general that the industry is mature enough that we can start having difficult conversations like this. And I'm also grateful that the company that I work with has this triple bottom line ESG forward philosophy that I can trust that just as Rick knew years ago that it was worth losing an employee to have her take a risk in her career. Um, Tom knew that I needed just a bit of time to be able to fully recuperate. And then um, now they know that even if it's not my physical health, that it's my emotional health, it's my relationship, it's my family. It's the idea that colon cancer has less than five-year life expectancy once it's malignant. And I have things to think about like 
you know, where my son's going to be when he's 10. Um, those are all things that are weighing on my mind and the company is giving me the space to be able to, to do that. I'm here today. Cause I, um, just really wanted to make sure that I gave that message. Well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing that deeply personal and really tragic story. I mean, I can't believe what you've been going through and like, you know, getting pregnant and laid off and having to find a home seems like small beans by comparison to what you're going through now. I'm so sorry to hear about your husband. Um, it's, it's all like little things that I got over, you know, you get over having a company file for bankruptcy, yeah. you get over moving cities or moving States, you get over, you know, you, you learn lessons from all these pieces. And what I've tried to do is be public with my stories every time I do. So I've, you know, back in when the industry was fairly nation, I would tell people here's openly how you should use LinkedIn because you will need a job in two years. And then when I got pregnant and all this happened, I knew that I had to share the story because there were so many other people out there going through a very similar time in their career. And the only way that I can make change within this industry is by being like a little spokesperson and being like, you can be a professional, you can be great at your job and you could also have these personal issues to deal with. And then I'm just really passionate about, um, not pulling up the ladder. So if I got a, a benefit, um, or if I even had a challenge, right. If I had a challenge, you know, I don't want everyone to have to suffer through, um, an unpaid maternity leave. I don't want people to suffer through, um, having a, a major illness and trying to figure out where you're, you know, if you should be working or not. I want people to learn from my story and ask for those things, ask for short-term disability coverage. Companies do that because it's way cheaper than trying to like figure out what to do or lose an employee. Like just do it guys. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and, and you might be surprised yeah. by the, the positive response and outpouring of support and love that you get in response. Um, you know, I, I, I've been following your story. I think you came out at the leadership forum in 20, was it 19? When, 2020. It was was last it 2020? The last 2020. one in Austin, yeah. the last business travel I did uh, for, for some time. Uh, I remember you were did you do a keynote speech or no, I did an impromptu speech. Okay. I literally, I was on the planning committee. I had gotten out of the hospital like three, four weeks earlier. And I started chemo like the next week. And I like made sure with my oncologist that I could go to that appointment or I go to that, that conference. Um, really cool story about that one though. So I told this story about, about being misdiagnosed because I was misdiagnosed with colon cancer. I had, I was just violently ill for the longest time. And everyone just said that I had stomach virus and clearly it wasn't a stomach virus, wow. but, um, I shared my story about being vocal to your doctors and not taking no for an answer. And that serious illness can happen to you. Even if you, I, I check off all the other boxes of being healthy. I've got the best blood for a cancer patient ever. You should ask my oncologist. Wow. Um, but at that event, uh, there was a woman in the audience who heard my story and thought it was great. And then this past year, so it was two and a half years later, her colleague, another guy under 40, got diagnosed with colon cancer and has a young family. And he also happens to live in the Denver Metro and reached out. She reached out to Rise, who then reached out to me. And I was able to provide that guy with support. And I told him what to expect from chemo. I offered to help with his daughter. I um, was able to give him that one-on-one -on -one support from somebody who's been there and had to work and is literally in the same industry. So I know what project cycles look like. Um, and that was so, so exciting for me because I felt like my story helped to shape someone else's experience. And I can't be there to, I'm not a medical professional. I can't decide which chemo or his treatment or anything else, but what I can do is tell him 
yeah, this is normal or this is not normal, or here's what I experienced. Here's how I juggled that. Here's what disability being on disability looks like. Um, and all those pieces just kind of gave his family comfort. And that could have only happened because I was incredibly vocal with my story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm really, I'm really inspired by your, your strength and your courage to share your story because it is so deeply personal. And to your point earlier, I do think we have a culture that expects us to just be okay all the time. And like your, your story about after you gave birth to your son and then you were traveling within six weeks is a perfect example of that, is that the reason why we push ourselves is because that's the expectation that we have in the workplace. And we don't, we don't have permission to feel. We don't have permission to have health issues. And it's not that the companies are going to fire you, right? They're, they're, they're not. For the most part, I've seen from solar companies, they understand the social impact that they were making on the industry and they want to be progressive. But unless a company outwardly says, this is the benefits we're giving our employees, this is what happens when you get pregnant, here is the permission you have should you need to take bereavement leave, should you need to, to have a family care issue, should you be battling COVID or any of these other things, should you have kids at home and you're in a work from home environment and the schools are canceled. Unless the company comes out and says that, there's always this, is this gonna be on my permanent record? Yeah, like a hesitation, um, yeah. A bit of a hesitation. And it's, in historically, it's been the onerous of the employee to come to the employer and say, this is what I need. And I was able to do that um, with the cancer story, but I, was and actually, I, I, I wasn't able to really do that with the cancer store. I still wanted to work. It wasn't until my company came to me and said, this is not going to penalize you. In fact, if you come back to work right now, we will penalize you. <laughs> like, please stop. Um, that, that just takes this power dynamic that employers have over employees and flips it to say, no, you know what, it's okay. And you're not in trouble. And this isn't going to affect you when you're looking for your next promotion. Um, because, you know, as a mid-career professional, you're always thinking about, you know, where am I going to peek out at the industry? And, you know, if, if I take leave now, does that mean that I'll never be in the C-suite? Um, if I, if I ask for this accommodation now, does that mean I can't ask for a raise later? Like you're always thinking about that as an employee. So I challenge employers to start the conversation first, start the conversation before somebody gets sick, mm. start the conversation before you find out your employees are pregnant, mm -hmm. have that conversation. Think about the benefits that you're offering now. Think about those worst case scenarios um, I am not by any means a consultant on this issue, but I can tell anybody my personal feelings um, and be forward thinking about those things. Because I think diversity, we can try so hard for diversity, but if we don't think about people as full people, then we're always going to attract the same types of of folks. We're always going to attract those like alpha males who will never get pregnant and odds are are hundred percent healthy until mm -hmm. they like break their leg on a ski hill or something. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah. So, well, cool. I, I, th I do think that's a new development though. I, I agree that this is something that has evolved and I feel like it's evolved over the last couple of years that there's been a, um, I guess more of a, like an acceptance or there's space for people to be human. Um, actually, the leadership forum, which took place last week, the, I forget her name. Was it Dr. Jessica Williams? What was her last name? I can't remember her name, but I honestly, um, I, I chaired that event, but I couldn't go to any of it because I was in the hospital with my husband. Oh, of course. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Well, 
Oh, um, oh the, the second keynote speaker. Yes. yes. You talked about anxiety. Is yes. About? She had yes. PTSD. And uh-huh. I, that, I was extremely moved yeah. by that because I've struggled with that myself. Yeah. And that is something like, you know, we, ha- we have physical health issues we have or disabilities, um, you know, and women get pregnant and apparently that's a disability anymore. Um, and then there's um, emotional and mental disabilities and all of it is really difficult to talk about in the workplace. So again, I think what you're doing is giving voice to people who maybe have hesitated or put a lot of pressure on themselves to keep going a hundred miles an hour and be a hundred percent, even though they don't have the capacity to, because of whatever they're dealing with, whatever, um, obstacle they're going through in their life or, you know, God forbid a spouse get, get sick and you, you need to consider that too. Yeah. I would go ahead of that and challenge, um, the last piece I wrote in my article was that who can make these outward power statements, right? I can, because I've been in the industry for 12 years. I've got a company that supports me really great. They have a long history with me. I'm not a new hire. I'm not a recent college grad. Um, I have a, a soapbox, right? I have a, a platform to be able to do those, those speeches and to be able to come out and say, this is what I need. I would love it if more leaders in the industry were to come forward and say, you know what, I'm going to take a mental health day, or I'm going to take this leave, or, you know what, I have to make my kids dance recital, um, and just be open with the fact that they are people. And then that is going to trickle down to some of our, our more junior employees. Um, and I think it's going to make I think it's going to make the generational change that needs to happen. I think people talk about Gen Z and them being very open about their battles with mental illness and all these other pieces. And I think a lot of that is kind of overstated, right? So there's that piece that you can have when you first negotiate for a job and you're like, cool, I want a job, ping pong tables, this and that. But then like when it comes, push comes to shove, does anyone, or push comes to shove, does anyone use those ping pong tables, right? Does anybody like actually take those time off? Do you, do you use the vacation days you're given? Um, or is it easier to just not do that? And if we see modeling from the top, which is really important at pivot, um, years ago, one of the first big benefits they gave all of us four weeks of vacation. And the rule is that you have to take one of those weeks as a consecutive week. You cannot just like take random Fridays for the entire year. If you do not take a full week of vacation, like you are persona non grata, like that comes up on your permanent record. Um, Everybody, including our CEO goes completely offline um, for a full week and then takes the rest of that PTO um, as bits and pieces or could take a few weeks of time. Um, Things like unlimited vacation time is great, but that also means that you may not take a whole lot of it. Mm -hmm. So let's start that modeling from the top Let's let leaders and companies come out saying, we not only understand, but we embrace and we want people with different backgrounds who are battling different issues. Um, One of the things that I think has really helped that how having a disability has affected my career is not just been about the soapbox, um, but it also made me realize how much the industry itself means to me. Like I had this major surgery back in August. It was, it's literally called the mother of all surgeries. It's the most intense surgery you can get. In fact, they take out a bunch of your organs and they pour hot chemo in you and they roll you around for like four hours. It's insane. Yeah. And I had a bunch of complications afterwards. I had, I was, my hemoglobin was low. I was this and that. And I won't get into too many details because I'm sure some people are listening to this while on their morning drive. Um, but I was told you can come back to work. My doctor approved me to come back to work at six weeks, but he was saying, you could take a few more weeks. I'll give you more doctor's note. And I said, you know what? The thing that I wanted to come back to work for was not, is my employer going to give me a raise? It was, I think that what we are doing is so important, solving the biggest challenge that humanity has ever faced is climate change. And every day that I'm doing that, I feel like a better person. 
And that is what drove me to come back to work after the six weeks. I was feeling much better by then. Um, but I did a soft re-entry. My boss worked to like, let me work behind the scenes and not tell everyone else that I was back. And then finally make that full re-entry when I was willing to take on a full workload, but I was able to take on a partial workload. I was able to scratch the itch of feeling like I was still making a difference, um, without jeopardizing, um, you know, my blood count levels or, you know, if I, you know, I had to relearn how to walk oh. after every surgery because they destroy your abdomen and you have to like be able to, to stand up and it's hard. Mm. Um, but I still wanted to come back, not because of a paycheck, but because I think renewables needs to come a long way because we have so much challenge. We've come so far and I'm so proud of us, but we have so much more to do because, you know, two degrees is a big deal. Yeah. And, you know, climate change, if, if I'm here with my son, when he is 10 or when he is 50, it doesn't matter. He is still going to turn 10. He is still going to turn 50. He is still going to inherit this earth from me. And if I didn't do everything that I thought I could to make it a cleaner and more sustainable place, I, I feel like I'd left too soon. Oh, get me going over here. I have goosebumps all over. On this very special episode of Soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think it's, it's a testament that if your company gives you the grace to take care of yourself if you're a committed and dedicated employee, you're still going to do whatever you can to do your work. And not because someone came in and ruled with an iron fist and told you you had to, it's because you're passionate about what you do and you're, you are with your company for, I guess you're, um, you have a purpose in your work. It's not just about, you know, clocking in or because your boss told you to do it, which is. It also meant that I didn't have to leave the industry. Right. Yeah. So I had somewhere to come back to that. I felt like I still could do this mission. So like, if I thought I was going to get fired, I, or if I did get fired, yeah, cool. I'm not working the time I have a disability. Great. And maybe there's insurance that covers it. Great. But if I don't have a job to come back to, and I don't feel like that job is fulfilling, then what's the point, mm-hmm. right? I could just try to, you know, live with less and, to me, it was, it was, I want to continue doing the good work that I think all of us in the industry are doing, not just as a pivot. Um, I think all of us are working diligently and hard. And, um, I want to see so many more people in the industry because it's only so hard and so fast, all of us can work. Um, so let's, let's make this a welcoming space for everybody. So to kind of pivot, if you will, back to, to the industry, what advice would you give to people who are considering or want to enter the industry? Yeah. Um, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. (laughs) I, I would say this is a good time to really follow your passion. I think the renewables industry is Yes, you hear all the buzzwords that it's growing, but if you're not passionate about providing new energy and new solutions and fundamentally disrupting how we are getting our our energy, you're going to burn out, right? You're going to, you're not going to have the spirit to invent a new way of of, of doing something and whether that be something as big as a PPA, but not all of us are trigger shaw. Um, it could be as simple as improving a process within the company in which you work. And if you feel inspired enough that clean energy is something and climate change is something that you want to solve or distributed resources or resiliency or any of those pieces are something that you want to solve, we want you here. And traditionally the industry has really taken a a preference for people who've had experience, um, which I don't know how much that's going to change anytime soon. So if you have to take a step back in your career, know that we are at the point in this industry where there is training and there is 
growth within, uh, within companies. So let's say you're used to being a manager and you have to step back to like an associate level or you're used to being in the C-suite and you just kind of need to start at a lower position than that. Figure out what your transferable skills are, figure out where your passion will take you, use those as highlights on your resume. But if for some reason you're not making the same money that you were in oil and gas, but this still makes you feel better, it's not that way forever. There's so much more upward mobility than there was a few years ago where you had to change jobs. So don't be discouraged, follow that passion, do a little bit of your time, and then know that there are just so many ways to, to, to be you in this industry now. So you shared a lot about your personal journey with Pivot Energy and how much the company has done for you as an individual. So you've kind of answered this question throughout this episode, but I do like to run a segment at the end of the Soapbox series um, where I ask my guests, what's in it for me? So Pivot, I imagine, is hiring like most other solar companies out there. Mm -hmm. Why should somebody consider joining Pivot? Yeah. So on the one hand, there's company culture, right? And I think that we talk a lot about company culture and what does that mean? Does that mean that um, you get a keg in the office? Yes, there, there is a keg in our office. That's <laughs> what it excites you. Um, but we've always been a triple bottom line focus company. Um, in the past, uh, we've just touted the certified B which is what we are still certified. And it's a very rigorous process. We've transitioned our language to be more ESG focused. And that is core to who we are. Environmental, social, governance, um, members of our staff from the associate level on through take part in committees that ensure that we are living up to those principles in everything that we do, whether that be a project that we take on that has additional social impact, but may not have the returns that are traditionally uh, associated with, with solar, whether that be um, employee welfare on new benefits, um, also you know, running little parties, I'm part of our party planning committee. Um, all of those pieces are a top-down and bottom-up piece that is very pronounced. And I challenge other companies to be able to take on that internally. We have had that for the seven years that I've known Pivot and um, the, the years before that, that um, the company has existed. And then I will say, as far as a company that is solving a big challenge, I think distributed energy is a fantastic way to provide equity into communities, to be able to provide benefits that reach out to local residents, be those jobs, but also be those energy savings, um, carbon reduction, environmental justice, all of those pieces are available through um, distributed solar and community solar in particular. We're breaking down barriers. Um, we're challenging our financiers to accept you know, no FICO scores, to be able to accept more LMI, to be able to create new programs that work within utilities, um, to fight for policies that support solar for everyone. And so if you have a passion about making solar more equitable, while also making solar um, sustainable, right? So we're not a nonprofit that is just constantly trying to put money into a mission, but not making profit. Um, we do scratch that itch um, to be able to combine those two things. Cause I think that's the only way to sustain. I don't think it's the only way. I think it's one way to sustain solar development in, um, in America is to, to mix those two pieces. So if you want a company that is forward thinking, has a good company culture and is really working to make an impact for um, the communities it serves and the employees that it um, employs, then Pivot is, is a great home for you. So I would most certainly recommend those, those all of those pieces. Thank you. That's really great information. Well, <laughs> Casey, I want to thank you so much for, for joining me today, for shedding your skin and sharing your story. Um, I've really appreciated getting to know you the past couple of years and really appreciate your participation in the Soapbox series.